Good evening, everybody. Cold winter night here in Pittsburgh. I got a nice crackly fire in the fireplace. Uh, so we're going to start out tonight again with uh, spreads. We did this the other night in the members area, but I had a bunch of requests during the week to see if we could do it again just so everybody would understand the math. So I'll go through it again quick, and then we'll go to some of the charts that are working well. So yeah, this is a kind of a, you know, almost the same presentation as uh, Monday night, but I've kind of reduced it a little bit just to concentrate on the actual numbers. So the whole concept of spreads is uh, when is a bullish spread most beneficial, and that's usually when the upside potential makes the uh, prospect of buying calls alone too expensive for the potential target. But even though you can see that it's going to move up somewhat, that the risk reward factor of buying calls outright might not be enough to be worthwhile for that price to move up so that you cover the expense of your the options, your break even, and then make a profit. So the best way to do that is uh when we can use candlestick signals and patterns, we can pretty much evaluate which direction the price is going to go based upon historic, obviously historic results of our signals and patterns, and then put the right option strategy on. So the, the advantages of a, a spread, and I'm just going to do the bull spreads tonight, is you have less money exposed to market risk. And the percent return is going to be greatly enhanced with a much smaller move uh, than what that potential move might be or what that potential move would have to be to make the same return on buying the calls outright because you're, you're putting money back in your pocket when you do the spread. And then the break even is much lower. So the advantage we have with candlestick analysis is at least we've got a high degree of probability of calculating or indicating which direction the price move will be. And then we've got some very good entry situations to uh, for the timeliness of the move. And then we can calculate based upon the signal or pattern what the strength of that move might be. Now, I'm going to kind of uh, expound on this because of somebody uh, showing an example today in the chat room of they bought some spreads, but they bought the March spreads two months out, and the price move was pretty strong, uh, up quite a bit, but the, uh, the result of the spread was only like 14 cents. So here's why. If I'm going to look for something longer term, I'm going to buy the calls or puts out, out, uh, outright. If I'm going to do a spread, I'm not going to go any more than two or three weeks out. That's for your debit spreads. I'll come back to that. If I'm doing a credit spread, I'm usually going to be keep it very short term, knowing that the price move is heading in the appropriate direction. But then if I do a credit spread, the, the profit Ability will be relatively small, but the probabilities will be extremely good for two reasons. One, the price may not even have to move from where it is based upon the credit spread that you just put on. Or two, that if you know it's heading in a direction, that's going to enhance it. But the worst case scenario is if even if that price of that uh, stock, underlying stock, doesn't move, you're still going to make a profit uh, on the debit spread. But let me go back to the why two or three weeks. Uh, when somebody mentioned they had bought a bullish spread, and I'm pretty sure it was on Netflix, 
They bought the 340s and sold the 345s, and the price moved up dramatically, as we saw during the day. They only made 14 cents on the spread. And the reason for that is, if you bought the 340s and you sold the 345s against it, now all of a sudden the price shoots up strong. Which option do you think is going to move as a bigger percentage? Well, probably the when it went up through the 345 immediately, your 345s are going to move up faster because what's the intention of most option investors? To get leverage for the time that they uh, uh, might be holding that position. So that means the options that are further in the money, meaning well below where the stock is trading, are going to move slower percentage-wise because people are buying the ones that are either at the money or out of the money. So the reason that you don't want to go too far out in the future is your optimal time for making that $5 difference between the 340 and the 345s is on expiration day because there's no more time premium built into your uh, option prices. So it should equate to be $5. Any time before that, you're going to have premiums. And so you might be sitting in a situation that even though the stock price is moving in the right direction, and there's too much time before ex or, uh, expiration, but the higher priced uh, strike price that you sold may be moving up faster than you're in the money. So you might be sitting with a very profitable stock move, but your spread isn't profitable until you get fairly close to the expiration day. So you, if, if you're sitting with something six, eight weeks out, and the stock price moves, and and the uh, higher priced option price or strike price moves faster, you might be sitting for four weeks with a negative uh, uh, spread or a price on your spread from where you bought it, even though it's moved up, because the, uh, the option prices uh, have moved against you. So... You want to keep it fairly close, like two to three weeks out, so that even if it moves up fast, the worst-case scenario is that all you have to do is now wait to expiration for that spread to start moving toward the $5 difference. I hope that rambling uh, was fairly clear to everybody. So what is a spread? Spread is a uh, where you buy one set of calls and you sell an equal number of calls against it in the same same uh, price or the same uh, option ladder. So in this case, they were buying the 340 for March, and they were selling the 345 for March. So where does the leverage come from? Here's the example we used the other night. Let's say we have a stock trading at 50, and our target is for 55. Let's just say hypothetically that might be a 50-day moving average is our target. And we can see from the amount or see from the uh, trend or the buy signal and where stochastics are that it could easily get to the $55 area. But that might be the limit for the time frame that we have left uh, if we're buying the calls. So let's say hypothetically we're buying the December 50 calls at $2.50. Well, if it hits our target of 55, that means our $2.50 now has gone to $5, or we've made a $2.50 profit or 100% gain. And our break even was that when the stock was trading at 50, we had to go to at least 52.50 to get our $2.50 back that we paid for that option price. Now, the difference is, if we think the target is 55, now if we buy the 50s for $2.50, and let's say we sell 
the December 55s for a dollar, that means we've got a net cost of a dollar fifty. We're paying out two fifty, but we're putting a dollar fifty back in our pocket. So our net is a dollar fifty. Now, if our target is hit at at uh, fifty five dollars, and it, it, that price now goes to five dollars, or we've made essentially a three dollar and fifty cent profit, which means we could move up this much. I'm going to go two weeks out, and I'm going to buy these calls, and I'm going to sell these calls. Now, that's not uh, anywhere near the top of that trend, but if I could buy these calls, and I'm just going to pick out numbers. Let's say I'm buying – I can't even see what these numbers are. I'm buying the 35s, and I'm selling the 40s up here, and it's costing me – 85 cents to do that. Well, now, if I'm going to hold this trend, let's say I bought calls here and I bought a spread here with the idea that if this moves up some, I'm going to make money on my calls. If it moves all the way up even to here or above that level, my 85 cents has gone to $5. Uh, but Jake, if you bought the stock at 50 and put a stop in at 48.50, you would only move, you would only lose more than the option strategy if gaps below your stop. That way, if it gives up, well, then there was no reason to buy the options in the first place. Um, Yeah, so you've had to, if you bought a thousand, or let's say a hundred shares of stock, you put out five grand. Whereas if you bought the spread, you only put out $150. All right, so let me uh, move down here. When I'm, my rule of thumb is if I'm going to buy a spread, I want to make, have it move at least two and a half times. So that means if I'm buying a spread that's going to eventually come out uh, uh, to go to $5, I don't want to don't want to spend any more than $2 for that spread. Now, that's just me. And the reason for that is on every option trade, you've got a little bit of a hurdle to, to get through to make money. First of all, the bid-ask spread, which is a bigger percentage on option trades than buying buying or selling a stock, and the commission, which would be percentage-wise a little bit bigger, even though it's not that big, and the price has to move in the correct direction. So to, to buy something where you're looking to make 100% profit or double your money is probably going to be in the long uh, long term against you because to double your money just to get to a profit, you had to overcome those, the hurdle of, uh, of buying the options in the first place. And that's right. And you've got the time factor. All right. So we're buying spread versus a straight-out call because of the math and the risk. So if I'm looking at something like this, right pan bottom breakout, I might have a combination of buying the calls and then coming up here and doing some spreads. In a case where the spread up here might be way out of the money, and I'm going to pick another figure. Let's say it broke out here at 50, and I bought the, uh, oh, the 50 calls for three weeks out at $2.50. So it's got to go to 52.50 to to uh, break even. But then I can come up here and maybe buy the 5250 and sell the 55 and I'm just going to pick out a number. Let's say it costs me a dollar 20 to do that. Well, if it goes up through the 55 level, now my dollar 20's gone to 
to five bucks or a good uh, percentage move. If it only goes up to 53, I've made money on my calls and uh, probably didn't make very much money or may have lost a little bit on the uh, on the spread. So what you're doing is you're leverage, leveraging the basis that if this price move is significant, that you've got better option strategies to take advantage of it where the price doesn't have to move all the way up here to make a big profit. Your spread is now giving you some extra leverage. Do you ever sell spreads? Yes. But that's a whole different uh, conversation. We're going to be doing that uh, training here pretty uh, soon of selling maybe put spreads to do a credit spread. So um, that's going to be in our members' uh, training probably within the next couple weeks uh, so, that, so that you can take a look and see what your strategies might be, whether you're buying the calls outright, whether you're doing a credit spread with a uh, bullish spread, or whether you're doing, what I say, that's a debit spread, or a credit spread by selling selling a put spread, not buying a put spread, selling a put spread. All right, so if I've got, this is what the timing does for me. But if I see something setting up, and I think this could be another move like this. I can be doing the exact timing uh, as far as when to be buying. Because I know that if I have a breakout, I've got the potential of wave one, wave three. So it gives me a lot more flexibility to, uh, uh, to, to make a, take that price move expectation and then figuring out the math. So here's kind of a, uh, situation we did a while back that when Amazon started back up, um, we could have bought the March uh, 1700 calls for nine dollars and thirty cents with the potential of it going up to 1730, which meant those calls would go from nine dollars and thirty cents up to thirty dollars. So the math on that is. But if you made twenty dollars and seventy cents on your nine thirty, you made two hundred and uh, uh, twenty percent, two hundred and two 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 percent profit. But if you bought the seventeen hundreds and sold the seventeen tens as a spread for a dollar eighty, all it would have to do is go up to. 1710 to have this dollar 80 go to 10 bucks for a much bigger percentage gain. I think I got it here. 455 percent, and the price only had to go to 1710 to make that much bigger percentage gain. If you had bought the calls for 930. The equivalent to make 455% would have been, I think the stock would have had to go up to 1751. Uh, Hope I have it here graphically. So I think somewhere in here, this is all the further it had to go up to make your uh, uh, spread profit. It had to go up here to make that same percentage gain. So you do have better setups now that you can go out as far as you want, depending on your risk factor, whether you want to go out three trading days, 10 trading days, 17 trading days, whatever fits into your comfort level. Would you ever roll the options if you miscalculated the move? Uh, you roll the options. Yeah, if your trend is moving in the right direction, but let's say not moving as fast as you think it should, you might come out of the uh, Januarys and roll into the Februarys. 
But the whole point of putting on the spread in the first place was analyzing what that price move should do based upon the strength of the signal or the pattern and the time frame that you are calculating. So just uh, like you would do on a normal trade, that if you came out of a trade and took profits and it turned around and started heading back up, you now have a decision to make. Is that the best place to put your money, getting back into that position after you closed out, or is it, are you better off going and find another trade setup that has much better potential to it? So you can't can't say that you might roll those options over. Now I will show you how to do that with a spread. Let me, and I'll get to that here in a minute, Jeremiah. So this is the uh, point of of what your risk factor is. What is your risk tolerance? Some people might be uh, more comfortable trading options that have three or four weeks to to move in the right direction. Other people might be more aggressive and say, all right, I'm going to buy the options that expire in 10 days. Now, the reason you can make that calculation is if you're looking at the candlestick chart, you can have a pretty good idea of what it's going to do on a very short time frame. And, Gene, you can calculate that. Let me see if I can find a chart. Well, I'll, I'll answer that question here in a minute, bit too, how you uh, calculate how much time. Oops, here's one right here. But let me go back here. You also have to calculate what is the likelihood of the overall market. What is the trend doing? So if you're, the market looks toppy, you're probably not going to be as aggressive as far as going further out on your uh, your option uh, time frame. You might say, all right, this market looks like it's only got maybe another couple weeks at most or another week to the upside, so I'm going to keep my option trade fairly short. So if I've got something like this, what's my calculation as far as the time frame? Well, if this is wave one, which took two and a half weeks, Maybe going to this level might take two and a half weeks. That wave three being the same magnitude as wave one, with potentially the same trajectory. So I've got a couple of different calculations. Maybe I buy, what, let's see, can't see where this one closed. It closed just at 81. So I can say, all right, maybe I buy a spread where I buy the 81s and sell the 8350s at 91 cents. Well, now if it goes to where I expect it to, up here to 85, I only need to really have it go to 8350 or higher to have that 91 cents go to $2.50 for my profit of a dollar. 59, which is 175% profit, and my break even is at at 81.91, whatever I, yeah, that price plus what I paid for it. Or if I think it will eventually get there, but everything looks kind of iffy, meaning the markets are getting a little bit toppy. Maybe I do this one. I buy the 83 and sell the 85. Now I only have uh, 27 cents in that trade. Now if it goes to my $85 price and, and the market doesn't hold it back, that means my 27 cents has gone to two bucks of dollar seventy three profit for 640% uh, profit. What did that do for me? Well, obviously, my risk factor was higher because it had to move all the way up here for me to be profitable. But my, or my reward factor was good. 
my risk factor was I only had 27 cents exposed to that trade. If it went bad, eh, I didn't have a whole lot of money uh, involved. So that also comes back to how much time do you have to expiration? You try to figure out what would be the trajectory, where would it be trading if my trajectory is correct. How far you go for the spread? Oh, um, I don't know which one was it. Oh, it's this showed here that I had 16 days trading days to expiration, so approximately three weeks. So I calculated on this one that maybe it would take three weeks to get up here, or maybe two and a half weeks and give me a little bit of extra time. All right, so again, this is why the uh, spreads have the advantage of where less money exposed to the market. Uh, two to three weeks is my average uh, time for a, for a bullish spread, yes. Once again, I don't want to be too far out in front of expiration date because if the price does move well, once again, the higher price strike price is going to move up faster than the in the money, the lower price, which means I might have a very good trade going on, but I'm not making any profits because the difference between the two has gone the opposite direction. So let's say, for example, I bought a spread for $2, where over the next uh, whatever time frame I had, it was eventually going to go to $5 if it went above the higher strike price. But if it moved too fast, that the difference between the the, uh, the spread might be that I'm at a loss, that the spread difference makes my $2 that I paid for it $1.80, and it might sit there for a while until the time factor starts moving the prices closer to where they should be because the time premium is dissipating. So I might have to sit in a losing position on a trade that's moving positive because the difference between the the two strike prices have gone against me percentage-wise, and that's why I don't want to be too far out. I want to – if I'm – if I'm going to be upside down for a little bit, I don't. Want, I only want to be upside down for less than two or three weeks. The percentage return is greatly enhanced, and the break-even is much lower. Now, another time to use option uh, spreads is when an option is too expensive. For example, this stock was moving up well. It looked like it had a big percentage move. And it's, it went from 80 to 100 and whatever this is, 110. So you can see the, the magnitude of the move. It could have gone way up here. Now, if I bought the February 115s for $10.25, I've got a lot of money. That's probably too much for me to spend on, a, on, on an option. But if I looked at the... February 115 and 125, so the 125, that spread was only $3.25. Now, what would happen if it went up above 125? My $3.25 was now going to 10 bucks. To say, make the same percentage return on that trade, if I bought the 115 calls outright, the stock would have to go to 146 to make my $10.25 make the same percentage return as the spread did. Plus, it had to go to 146, whereas it only had to go to 125 to make that that uh, that return. So there's another 
method. Let's say I bought calls right down here. And I closed them out here. Had a good profit. But then my ego said, oh, man, they're still taking this back up. I want to buy back in. Now, do I want to buy new calls with the trend already moving pretty good, but it's it's still staying above the T line and looks like it has more upside? Probably not. So maybe I come in here and I put a spread position on where I have less money exposed, still got the leverage, that if it moves in the right direction in a higher risk situation with stochastics up here, that I'm still making a good percentage return, but I've got less money exposed to the trade. So that's another area to use a spread. And so here's my upside expectations on January 14th. Okay, Harry, all right. That we could buy the January 31 weeklies the 52 calls for $1.65. Or we could buy the January weekly 53.57 spread. Now that's moving up a little bit, but we've got $1.20 in it. So if it went to 57, that meant our 120 went to four bucks or $2.80, 233% gain. And if we bought the calls outright, to get that same gain, the stock would have to go to 60. So the dollar 65 make the same percentage as what it would have to do here on the spread, where it only had to go to 57. Which that our ex upside expectations, the spread only needed to go up to this level, and for the buying the calls outright to make that same percentage return, they had to go up to this level. Uh, Gene, that's also up to you. Again, I can look at the uh, the ladder and say, I only want to be two weeks out, so I go to the uh, the ladder, which is that scale of how far out you want to go. Let's say I, what is today? Let's say I want to go just a couple weeks out. Maybe I'll pick the... Uh, Options that expire on February 7th. Um, so that becomes the, the ones I want to trade. Okay, did we do this? Yes. Less money exposed. The percent return is greatly enhanced. The break even is much lower. So I would guesstimate that probably 75% of my option trades are spreads just because of these factors right here. So that gets rid of that problem that most people uh, have a problem with where they're buying the, the options and the stock goes up, but they didn't make any money. Uh, CB, yes, you could go to the 31. To, uh, let me, I'll get back to that. Now I forgot what I was saying. No, that's just a fine how they do. Oh, about 75% of my trades are are spreads. If I think something's going to go up fast or big, like out of a fry pan bottom, I might do a combination where I'm buying the calls and doing a call spread. Now, I'm going to have to do some switches here, but let me do this. Uh, While well, everybody's here, remember, Saturday we are going to be doing a training session for four hours on what I call candlestick convergence. That's where when we do uh, an analysis, of that quick, not quick, but that instantaneous visual analysis based upon identifying the signals and patterns, and figuring out a lot of people say, well, you've got a ton of good charts. How do you pick out the best ones? That's where convergence analysis, and I, I use the word convergence because if I can see that it's bouncing off the 50, that it did a, uh, uh, 
a strong signal, the uh, best friend signal, and it closed up above the T-line, and it broke the downtrending uh, trend, and I uh, uh, can't think of another factor. But the more pieces of evidence that you can put into your analysis, the higher the probability the, uh, that you're going to be in a uh, correct trade. So, okay, yes, and Becky just put in the link. Here's the link. The time, uh, Saturday, I think we usually try to start at 9.30. And we promise everybody four hours, but like most of our sessions, they go on for five to six hours. And it's the type of thing where because the uh, yeah, we don't rush through it, You've got a lot of opportunity to let it sink in and ask questions as we're going along. Okay, so that was bull spreads. Now, let me see if I can do this. Uh, do, do. I don't know what that just did. Nah, that didn't do it. Ah, I thought I could bring back some of the... Uh, It will be recorded, yes. I think I can do this. Hold on. I'm going to have to. Which one? This one. Let me go down here. Trying to find an example. Okay. This is what I was looking for. Somebody was saying, well, how do you, uh, how do you pick which ones? First of all, the first analysis, uh, you're looking and seeing the market is heading up. And then you want to see which strike price you want to pick on a stock like NVIDIA where we might think that it's eventually going to come up here. So what makes the most sense? And I'd see if I can figure out the price. Now, it closed at 167 on this date. If I think it could come all the way up here, and I don't know what that price is. Oh, I can't see it. Looks like 175. A little bit more conservative, I buy the 167.50, sell the 172.50 for $2.31. And that's a little bit over my, my, uh, oh, uh, my criteria. Above $2 to make $5. I can also look at the 170s and 175s for $1.84. Maybe that's a little bit better for the risk reward. Or, I'm going to be real aggressive, and I buy the 175, 180s for a dollar twelve for them to go to five dollars. Well, that seems like a lot of room, or a lot of distance. So I might come back to one of these, or I might even take a look at a. Uh, uh, I don't know. Is there something in between now? Or. It might make more sense to buy the 170s and sell the 172.50s. So I, I want to take a look at each one as far as the math so that I know how far up this potential could go. Now I'm using, I guess it was 180 that it could go to up here. Or, depending on how aggressive I think I want to be, if this is wave one, wave three could take me all the way up here. So I might buy calls here, and I might buy a spread up here. So it just kind of gives me a little bit of flexibility. We did those. We did those. We did all those. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Jeremiah, 
It will be recorded, and this is one of those training sessions that if you've been looking at candlestick charts, you've been hearing my droning night after night, now we're pinpointing the things that your eyes should be uh, uh, recognizing that will add better probabilities of being in a correct trade. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to live charts and kind of point out some of those as we're doing uh, the rest of the charts. So the first thing I want to do, I think, get back here somehow. Let me make this a Okay, I'm going to. Is that coming up all right? All right. Let me go through what we are in right now. Uber, as we can see, broke out. So here's one of the things. Uh, When would you buy a call? Oh, I was saying that if I thought the price move was going to be like this, I might be buying calls outright just as it breaks out. But I think it's going to be a substantial move. So I'm buying calls right here, and I might do a spread right here, with the logic being that the call can make some money. Now the the disadvantage to a spread is if this stock, if I buy the calls right here and I'm, and it goes all the way up here, I've probably got a huge profit. But not all stocks have big substantial moves. We happen to be in a bull market, so we're getting those. A lot of times they move up, they pull back, they move up, they pull back. So you're better off sometimes buying a spread so that it gets up to the level you've got a decent profit. Or if you think it's going to be a substantial move, you buy the calls here and buy some spreads up here. But if it does move up here, your calls are making good money and your spread makes good money. Now I forgot what I was saying. Oh, so here was the other one that we had come out of with good profits. Make this. Ah, oh, humbug. Had good profits in it, took profits, wanted to get back in, but because it was a higher risk situation, it was better to put a spread on. Uh, with less risk, less exposure, but still participating in the upside. This one has been very good ever since we saw the little gap up off the moving averages. Again, part of your convergence analysis. The Cassocks in the oversold area, you're seeing buy signals right off a major moving average. You gap up through the T line. You add that all up, there's been a drastic change of investor sentiment. Fitch, let's see if these are the best time frames. I want that. Fitch, this is why you want to understand what a classic pattern is. Classic pattern is your fry pan bottom breakout. And then set up for a J-hook pattern. So what is your prerequisite um, for a J-hook pattern? A very strong price move. What's your result coming out of a fry pan bottom? A strong price move. So the classic pattern is seeing the strong price move, seeing profit taking, and then getting ready for the next wave of the J-hook pattern. So Fitch can still be bought. Now, why would you buy a stock? That's already up in the overbought area and has moved up a good 25% because we can recognize what pattern setup it's doing. I wouldn't buy it here, but I would buy it here because I know what this pattern is telling me, that there's more upside after the consolidation. 
iRobot. Kind of that same scenario. And notice what it did today. Still closed above the T-line and looks like it could be setting up a J-hook pattern. ENPH. Kind of a little J-hook pattern and notice what amplifies the prospect of a J-hook pattern. Look what you had right here. There's your morning star signal right smack dab on the T-line. Now where are you? You're right here at the breakout level. So if you're long, what do you want to see? You want to see it open positive and trade breaking out. What you don't want to see is it opening lower. When would you do a spread on iRobot? You could tomorrow on a positive open. Because where do you think, here is, uh, here's what the, uh, again, the convergence analysis is going to do for us. What happens when they come up through a resistance level? They come back and test it to see if it's going to act as support. How do we have any advantage with candlesticks to see it's going to act as support? Hammer signal, doji, hammer doji, bullish confirmation. What did it tell us when it got back here to the 50? They couldn't sell it off. The bulls were stepping in. So if they support on the 50, I can't get rid of that darn little thing. Get rid of it. <laughs> That to it. Dang. If they come up through the 50, hold back to the 50, when is it a good time to buy? Right in here. Because everybody and their brother can see that uh, they supported on the 50. Where do you think it's going to go to now? If it's supported to the 50, where's your next target? The 200. Uh, ENPH, you could have, yes. But we were discussing that today in in the chat room, that if you got stopped out, and this is why, unless, and this is why you watch to see what the market's doing. Remember, the market went down 200 points uh, very, very close, or very quickly. And then started coming back up. Everything went down and started coming back up. Now, if it had closed down here, yeah, it would have closed out the position. Because if it closed down here, what color candle would you have had? It would have probably had a dark candle. And where did this all occur? Right at this level. And I'll get to some of those here in a minute. So this is why the key line is a very important factor. That you stay long as long as it doesn't close below the T line. Here's another one. But if it starts trading positive tomorrow, you're probably in the next wave to the upside. JELD, another one that held right on the T line and started back up. Where do you think this one's going? Probably right back up into the trajectory of this uptrend. So we have a, a, a huge advantage of Number one, the key line in itself acting as a natural support level. And two, knowing what type of signals are occurring at a support level, whether it's the key line or the 50 or the 200, we can see exactly what investor sentiment is doing at those levels. Now, this is why uh, people like to do the uh, convergence analysis, because once you've analyzed the signal, in this case a kicker signal, now you can calculate what your trend should be doing based upon the patterns and the T line and any other indicator that's telling you uh, the probabilities are still in your favor that you're heading up. NK, you can see what it's been doing. Notice how it's been using the T line as support. Now, I Mentioned this over and over. The reason that is an important visual evaluation is because nobody has the T-line on their charts. Uh, 
Jill, hang on to your individual uh, positions or requests until uh, I tell Jim to do the double line. And then tonight, because we're running late, if everybody would just put in one request, we'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, So get a good debit spread. Uh, Gary, no. The whole point of of uh, the of doing the spread is to to control that five thousand dollars worth of stock with a lot less money. So your position, your dollar amount, is based upon what your risk factor is not the control of a certain amount of uh, stock. So if I was going to buy 100 shares and instead of putting up $5,000, maybe I want to just put up 500 shares and buy two spreads. Okay, so back to the reason, the analysis of this coming back to the key line and supporting is very important in the sense that nobody has the key line on their charts. Very few people, us being part of that. So when it comes down to this level and bounces, it's not coming down to a level that everybody's watching because they don't have it on their chart. It's coming down to what we now know is a kind of a natural support and resistance level. So there are times when you start closing out a position. There was your big evening star signal. There was your doji right on the T-line. So what's our simple factor of a doji? The price is usually going to move in the direction of how they open it after a doji. If it opens lower, what's that telling you about the T-line? It's not holding. So if you were long, your trading strategy at this point was it had to open positive and trade positive. If it opened lower, Close out the position. I closed out Luck and Coffee the other day, or what is today? Thursday. Yesterday, because look what happened. We had a bearish left right combo and a close below the T line. Remember what happens to our probabilities if it closes below the T line. Probabilities are pretty strong that things are now in a negative trend or you don't want to be, the probabilities are against you. You don't want to be long. Barry was a good setup. Let me make this smaller. As far as a scoop pattern. So how long does our scoop pattern uh, maintain its integrity? As long as it doesn't close back below the T-line. Today it did. So it closed out the position. Why? Because it was telling us that the probabilities just went against us of being in a slingshot situation of a scoop pattern, but now there's kind of a resistance level up here. Same scenario on GTT. Had a nice fry pan bottom, but look what was happening right in this range. And look what was happening to your stochastics. Started to roll over. So what's this telling you about your probabilities? Looks like it just closed below the T-line after a shooting star. Let's make this bigger where we can see it. After a shooting star that came out of the range, came back into the range with a shooting star up in the overbought area, what did we need to see to stay in this position? Logic just says it needed to open positive and trade positive. If it opened lower, after a shooting star in the overbought area, what's it telling us about this resistance level? It's still acting as resistance. Close out the position and move on to something else. Made some very good money in this one. Little J-hook pattern. I think this was a resistance level that it broke through. How would you figure what your stop should be on a call? or a put option. It's not based upon the price of the option. Remember, 
The option is a method for buying the stock. So if you're analyzing a stock and you're buying the calls to get leverage to own that stock, when do you sell uh, or when do you put a stop in? You put a stop in based upon the, uh, on the stock price. That if the stock price comes down through a certain level, you, there you have what they call contingency orders. You can put in that if the stock comes down and hits X, close out the, uh, the option position. So if you're long SPCE, what was our alert for getting ready to take profits on this one? Anybody? Well, the doji today, the gap up, yep. Gapped up way above the T-line. Good one, Jake. Gapped up. Nancy, good. So two things that we're telling us to watch out. We're in the overbought area. They're starting to gap this up. And look how far away we've moved from the T-line. What's our simple T-line rule? The further away you move from the T-line, the higher the probability it's going to come back and test it. What's our exuberance, Jason? Yes. If they're gapping up in the overbought area and moving away from the T-line, that's your evidence of exuberance. It did a bearish harami today. If I was long this, I would have closed out half the position today. And what's my next criteria? It has to open positive and trade positive to stay in it. If it opens lower, where do you think it's heading to? Right back down here. Now, why does it do that? Because human nature works the same way time after time. If you bought the stock right here at 12 and it was up here at 20, and you had whatever that is, a 72% profit, what are people going to do? Or what's the smart money going to do? They're going to start taking profit. That's where we have the major advantage of knowing this is a bearish harami, doji. We know the doji rule. If it opens lower, it's going to move in the direction how they open after a doji. That's where you start taking your profits. And what was the alert? fact that they gapped it up and they moved that far away from the T-line. So could this go up further? Definitely. But if it opened lower tomorrow, the reason that we're looking at candlestick signals in the first place is that the Japanese rice traders provided us visual evidence of a signal and telling us what should be expected after that signal. So look what happened here on Western Digital. What do we got going on? Wave one, wave two, now it gapped out into wave three. And if it opens positive, which a lot of them look like they're going to do because of Intel having some very good earnings uh, and trading up four points, it looks like wave three could be starting. Uh, Jim. Use whatever works for you. What we're providing is um, what we're providing is the framework for what works. Now, some people might trade off the five minute chart, some people off the fifteen. It's whatever somebody uh, wants to have on their charts or how to use their charts. Secondly, darn, I don't even know what I said firstly. Oh, if somebody says, hey, put the XYZ indicator on your, on your chart, you can see that these charts are relatively simple because the main criteria for what to do is based upon the signal and the pattern. Everything else is just kind of a confirming indicator. So, if somebody says, put the XYZ uh, 
put Bollinger bands on, put uh, Movo bands, put this or that on. Put them on there. And if they work for you, keep them there. If they don't work, take them back off. The more you can keep your uh, trading simple based upon the signal itself or the pattern itself, the better you're going to be able to evaluate everything quickly. Jake, these are all done based upon scanning four stocks that have op or have volume greater than a certain amount. My criteria is I want to look at stocks that are trading more than 200,000 shares a day. So the volume's already built into my universe. There's about 8,500 trading entities out there in the uh, stock market. So I have a criteria that I only want to look at stocks that are trading greater than $5 and that trade more than 200,000 shares a day. Those two qualifying pieces of criteria knock my trading universe down to about 2,700, sometimes up to 3,000. Um, so out of that 2,700 doing scans every day, I'm going to have way more stocks than I need. And again, the volume's already built into that, that universe. Now, does volume play a part? Not really, except, let me find something. If right here was a breakout and you had big volume, yeah, that's telling you there's new, new buyers or new uh, ownership. If the Bollinger Band squeeze works, Deborah, use it. I mean, this is the whole point of this. Keep it simple and learn to analyze what uh, uh, what indicators work well for you. So this is why when people say, "Oh, you've got so many stocks that look good," how do you how do you uh, find the best ones? It's very simple. Learn four or five signals and patterns and become an expert at them. That doesn't necessarily mean you disregard the rest of them. You want to be acquainted with the rest of them. But if you analyze, if you figure out four or five and become very adept at those, now you're controlling your own uh, trading and not having to depend on other people's recommendations or listening to Kramer or listening to the talking heads. The, there's only one analysis that is correct on price moves, and that's the market itself. Uh, yes, uh, Mesa, if I look at an option price and I can see that they're bidding $4 and they're asking $5, that's a pretty wide spread. So if I like the position, now those spreads are going to be like that usually on lower volume stock. And a lower volume stock could be 500,000 shares or less each day. So the bigger the volume in the stock, the, uh, the more liquid, obviously, the options are going to be. The open interest usually isn't a major factor for me unless I'm going in and buying 50 or 100 options at a time, which right now I don't have time to do that. If I'm going in and buying maybe 10 or 20 options at a time, uh, you know, the open interest isn't that major a factor. Now, again, the bid-ask spread is going to tell me whether the open interest or whether I can get into the in and out of that position easy is, is uh, that, that bid-ask spread is going to be my indicator. Now, if I see something that they're bidding for and asking five, I'll put it in at 450. And if they don't hit it after maybe five or seven minutes, that tells me, ah, there's not enough activity there. If I really like it and want to push on it, maybe I move my 450 up to 460 and leave it there for another three or four minutes. If they don't hit it by then, remember, just because there's a price move, if you can't make money off of it, then that's, you're not there to 
help somebody else make money, move on to something else. Yes, the tighter the better. Obviously, on Apple, you might be looking at a spread of three cents between the bid and ask. On something that only trades 240,000 shares a day, you might be looking at a spread of 70 cents between the bid and ask. Okay, I'm getting way off topic here. Oh, so here's why the T-line is a relevant uh, indicator. Because what, and I'll say this as general, what do most people do? They get a profit. Oh, I'd hate to, oh, I've got a good profit. I better take my profit quick because, boy, would I look stupid if I had a profit and I let it go back to be a loss. Well, that kind of diminishes when you can see the patterns. And then notice if you were in the calls or in, uh, in Apple, what was the criteria for not selling this stock? It's never closed back below the T-line. Do you decide on in-the-money spreads or out-of-the-money spreads, depending on the pattern or your expectation? Uh, no. That is the risk-reward factor of each individual person. If you're not, if you're fairly conservative, you're probably going to do spreads on things that are closer to being in the money or at the money, you're not going to make a, as big a return. But if you're using the candlestick charts that tells you there's a good probability the direction is going to move in this direction with this magnitude, then depending on, again, your risk tolerance, maybe you're a little bit more aggressive and you buy an out-of-the-money uh, spread. So in the money, at the money, or out of the money is based upon each, each individual's uh, uh, risk tolerance. So anyways, this is what I used to make good money when candlesticks came along. I made much better money when we applied the key line to the, to the charts. So some people say, well, how do you participate in something like this? Netflix, you can't. You didn't know all of a sudden they were going to do this. But on something like this, at least you had a signal that you knew what to do afterwards. What do you do on this one? It's probably not your best chart. If you happen to be long, you can stay long. But a lot of people ask, well, how do we, how did we account for that or how did we anticipate that? You can't. But there are thousands of trading setups out there where based upon the information that is built into candlestick signals allows us to know what to do with those patterns and take advantage of them instead of commiserating that you didn't hit every, uh, every big trade. Tesla, another one that told us the J-hook pattern. How long do you stay in this one? Right now, until you see a sell signal and a close back below the T-line, or a substantial sell signal. And Amazon, which everybody asks about, this is where I always say observe the obvious. Which way is Amazon moving right now? Pretty much sideways. So Amazon doesn't, yeah, Amazon's not a trader right now. You want to be looking more at things that you can at least identify what might be happening with the trend and the uh, pattern, like NVIDIA. Slow curve, use the T-line as support. If it opens positive, it's breaking out. At least you can make a, make an assessment of what's, what's going on. And what you really want to be able to do is evaluate probability of a trade is going to be. If this opens positive tomorrow, what type of pattern do we have? Anybody? A J-hook? Bobble breakout? Yes. 
Bobble breakout, J-hook pattern. So what's the difference between a J-hook and a bobble? Bobble is just more defined. You can see where it resisted. You can see where it pulled back. And where did it pull back to? Right smack dab to the T-line. So if it opens positive, what do we got? We've got a high probability of a J-hook pattern that if this was a 25-point move, this could probably take you up close to the 145 area. So I can already make calculations. Now, what's, what's more defining about a bobble pattern? Because you can see where they sold. You can see where they come up and bought. So it's a J-hook pattern with just a lot more definition to it and a lot more probability to it also. So if I am sitting here at night and saying, all right, if this opens positive tomorrow, what do I want to do? Well, let's, let's take a look at some spreads. Maybe I'm buying calls, the, the 122s. Maybe I'm buying the 125 and selling the 128s just to get some extra leverage. So I've got a lot more options on my option trade. There's Domo, same scenario. What do we got going on right now? There's your bobble breakout. So if we know what to do based upon the signal or pattern, now what you've done is if you specialize, uh, Jill, whatever you want to do. If you want to go, what is today? Friday. Let's say you go to the next next Friday's options and you sell sell a, sell a put spread. You put that money in your pocket with the uh, prospects that it's going to go higher. All depends on what strategy you want to do based upon your investment nature. Some people put credit spreads on every week. Doesn't make a whole lot of money. But they are very, very high probability trade setups. So that's a bobble pattern. The difference between a bobble and a J hook is there's the J hook is using support and not seeing anything that everybody else is watching. But DDD, you can see where it says bounce, and then an inverted hammer, then bullish confirmation. I'd be a buyer if it comes up through this level or even positive trading tomorrow. Uh, consistency, Jill, is exactly right. You'll be surprised, not you'll be surprised, you should know that if you can improve your correct trade ratio, that your compounding effect is going to be hugely better than trying to get the big trades are hitting the trades right exactly at the the bottom and selling exactly at the top. So that's not feasible. But if you can consistently get the fat part of trades and know when the next trade is setting up with a high degree of probability, you don't have to make all the money out of that trade. But if you keep making money on a good percentage of your trades, your uh, – your compounding effect is tremendous. HIMX, another J-hook pattern with kind of a morning star type signal, inverted hammer. There's your classic kind of fry pan bottom J-hook pattern. Uh, Uh, calculated Twillo. Uh, because this is wave one. Wave three is usually the same magnitude as wave one. Not 
that I thought it was a bad stock, but had a 20% gain and had a stock that was up 20%, and I lost the whole profit the other day. You lost the whole profit. Uh, Jake, I don't know where you bought, would have bought the calls, but I wouldn't have bought calls here. I wouldn't have bought calls here, but I would buy calls here because I can see the pattern telling me that the new wave is about about to start. Pet Q looks like it's got the potential of a J hook because look where the low was yesterday, right smack dab on the T line. I think we did iRobot. Nope, that's not what I was looking for. IRTC. Another J-hook pattern in the making. Plantronics. Plantronics. Setting up. Bullish Harami. What's a Harami tell us, especially as a doji? The selling has stopped. If this opens positive, where do you think the next target's going to be? So, again, this is not rocket science. This is just evaluating what the Japanese rice traders have provided for us for years. When they pull back and they use the T-line as support, when can you be buying this one? Positive open. you got a J-hook pattern. Expect more upside. That's our TRX. Whose handwriting is this? Lynette, same scenario. And the evidence is, am I missing? I can't be missing. Am I? Ah, you are right. Thank you. I wonder how many others I have done like that. Yes, there. That's why I was a little bit more evidence. Let's see, RTRX. There's that. That's better. All right. Thank you, Casey. I was wondering why some of these weren't as resilient. So there's uh, IRTC. There's the J-hook pattern. If it opens positive, what do we got going on? Our classic pattern. If this starts trading up, what do we got? Our classic pattern. Uh, so when does a – so patterns work based upon what we expect. Beyond me, J-hook pattern. What did we need to see here? Well, we saw a bearish harami. What's a bearish harami tell us? The buying has stopped. Let's see, PLT, did I not do that right? Yeah, closed at 32.26. Yep, up a dollar nine. So, why do you want to become an expert knowing what to do on each one? Because if this is a J-hook pattern, what should we have seen on this day? More upside, a breakout. A bearish harami, what would that tell us? They didn't break through. If you were planning to buy this or if you bought it up here, you would definitely back out here. Now, does this mean this is over? No, but our J-hook pattern probably has disappeared. But maybe it's uptrending channel as long as it stays above the key line, which makes it for a different uh, uh, different approach or different evaluation. So here's what we're going to be looking at when we're doing convergence analysis. Indecision, indecision, indecision. Hits the 50. Bullish engulfing. The casting's coming up off the 50, through the T-line, through the 34. What's our next logical analysis? 
we can be buying this on positive trading with the expectation that if this is wave one, wave three is going to take us up in this area. Is this a safe trade? Definitely, because we can see everything that everybody else is watching, a bullish engulfing, off the 50. Everybody and their brother was watching to see what was going to happen at the 50. We saw exactly a bullish engulfing signal. Now, is that just a pop-up? Well, we know that's a signal in the oversold area, different than if it had just opened higher and traded higher. It did a bullish engulfing signal. So what's our strategy on this one? What's the pattern and expectation? On, well, that's what we're looking at right now. It's been heading down. It hit the 50. It did. What, what could we see happening at the 50? The buyers were stepping back in. So what would confirm our bullish engulfing signal? Positive trading tomorrow. Oh, I don't know, Casey, what was the volume on it today? Which ETF I usually use, Labu. All right, let me get through some more of these, or we're going to be here until the cows come home. So this is exactly what you expect based upon using the Convergence analysis, buying right at the 50, kind of a scoop pattern back up through the uh, T-line, a breakout of this level. This was a safe time to start buying. Uh, 330,000 shares, uh, yeah, on a $6 stock, it's not terrible. As I say, my minimum is... 200,000 shares on a $5 stock. So depending on the size of your portfolio, if you're buying $40,000 positions, maybe you don't want to buy a $6 stock that trades 300,000 shares a day. What would that be? I can figure this out. Six, 7,000 shares, that might be a little bit hefty. Probably not bad. But obviously, you don't want to be going in and buying a 10,000 shares of a stock that only trades 120,000 shares a day. You're going to have a hard time getting in and out of that one. Uh, if you're looking at this one, that could be your first target. Wave one, wave three. Now, that could be the expectation based upon wave movement. But what is the final criteria for when to get in and when to get out? Candlestick signals. If it got up here and did a bearish engulfing signal before it got up to this level, the sell signal tells me it's time to, to close out the position. No matter what the expectation was. Arco. Look what it's doing, right smack dab off the 50. Doji, bullish confirmation, scoop type pattern. What's it telling us about the 50? We can see exactly what investor sentiment was doing at those levels. Bullish engulfing on FGEN. Today, as it pulled back to the 50 again, it did a bullish harami. If it opens positive, what do you got going on? Buy signals at the 50. We're starting our next wave. So what we're looking for is the setups. Ah, that was a setup yesterday. But if it opened positive and trade positive, let me see what's got a couple written down here. EXPR. There's our kicker signal. There's our doji. Wait a minute. Let me go back to L brand. Let's see. Ah, there it was. Sorry about that. I don't know how I keep sliding that way. So what's our setup? If it opens positive tomorrow, what's it telling us? One out of a gap up 
doji. If it opens positive, which direction is it going to move? It's going to trade positive. What type of signal is that going to be? A bullish flutter kicker signal. If it opens positive after a spinning top doji type day, which way is it going to move? It's going to move positive. What would that tell us about our 200-day moving average? It's not acting as resistance anymore. So these are setups where you can get be put or get into place. Oh, just a setup. Ah. There was our setup. When we see a doji right at a resistance level, if it opened positive, what's it telling us? That resistance level is not acting as a resistance. Why is that? Because we know the doji rule that if it opens positive, it's going to trade positive. And if it does trade positive, it's a, uh, it's going to have this magnitude candles approximately the same as this, telling us it's breaking out. A bullish flutter kicker versus a bullish kicker is, uh, what did we have as a kicker signal? D-Lab is a kicker signal. It opened here closed here, gapped up, and went the opposite direction. That's a kicker signal. A flutter kicker signal, is that L brands, is opens here, closes here, gaps up and does a doji. And then the doji rule, if it opens positive, it trades positive. So the doji is that little flutter. If you took that little flutter out of there, you essentially have a kicker signal. Was it EXPR? EXPR was a kicker signal. Opened here, closed here. Gapped up, went the opposite direction. Now what do we got going? Pretty much that if it opens positive tomorrow, what, what do we have as far as our setup? Well, we know if it opens positive, it's going to trade positive after a doji. And if it does trade positive, what type of magnitude? Like this, what's it telling us about our resistance level? It's probably breaking out. Yes, your doji sandwich telling you that it's not in that trend anymore. Oh, I had that one. Yeah, that was right under LB. And Cuervo, where's our breakout? Right there. If this opens positive tomorrow, what's that telling us? We've got a fry pan bottom breakout, a lot more upside. Kind of the same scenario of Western Digital today. Kind of a little J or a J hook fry pan bottom breakout. INMD. That's a trend kicker signal. You can see your kind of your bobble breakout J hook pattern. Opened here, closed here. What had it do today? Gapped up above the previous day's open and went this direction. So it's not a reversal at the bottom. It's what we call a trend kicker, which usually implies there's a lot more strength coming into that trend. And this one, also a breakout of a J-hook pattern. And how did this whole pattern start? Opened here, closed here, gapped up, and went the other direction. A lot of strength. So a lot of people ask, well, what are your strongest uh, uh, signals and patterns that you would look at? If I was picking out four, it would be the best friend. It would be the kicker signal. It would be the fry pan bottom breakout, and I can think of another one. Uh, no, it could be the J-hook pattern. Now, the reason you want to know a few different ones is J-hook patterns are working well right now. Maybe next month it's a different pattern. 
Yeah, there you go. The bobble pattern. Yes. So we're looking at charts that have all sorts of good patterns to them. But a lot of people say, well, there's just so many. How do you pick them out? You don't have to. Learn four. And if you become very good at four, I can pretty much guarantee you that on any given day, you will have more trades available to you than you'll be able to handle, which puts you in a situation where now you're cultivating or you're analyzing to see which one of those signals and patterns that you know very well are going to be the best ones out of those. Once you start doing that, now the concept or the the uh, prospect of investing now becomes something that you control versus being at the whim of uh, of the market itself. This is ever another one that's right at the breakout level. FTAI, your best friend gap up, right here at the breakout level. Now, here's just kind of simple logic. If this is your resistance level, and they've gapped up and went right to that resistance level, that means they don't probably do not have any regards for this resistance level, number one, because they gapped up to get there. Why would they gap up to get to a resistance level? It's probably because they don't care about it. They're going through. And what makes it more evident that this is a strong signal? Well, there's our best friend signal telling us we're probably starting a wave, another wave to the upside. There's kind of your little trend, or not trend kicker, but your kicker signal. Open here, close here, gapped up, and look where it gapped up. Out through this resistance level, more upside. APT is one of those that when it breaks out, this is where candlestick analysis becomes a great advantage to an investor because now we can calculate. We know that there's a lot of activity. So if you're going to be an aggressive trader and you're in a situation you know there's a lot of activity, now at least you can find your can or uh, follow your candlestick charts to know exactly what to be doing in something that's going to produce a lot of profits uh, very quickly. Same scenario on the short side. There's your bearish J-hook pattern. Now, a traded positive, this is uh, United Rentals, URI. Traded positive, possibly supporting here. Well, what do we look for? Well, if this opens lower and starts trading lower, that tells us our bearish, our bearish J-hook pattern is still in progress. We shorted Weight Watchers. There's your kind of your uh, bearish cradle pattern. And then notice what's happened right here at the T-line. Gap down. There's your first potential target. If it doesn't support here, where do you think it's going to? Right here, which kind of coincides with that downtrend. Again, things that everybody else is watching. RGA, same scenario. Would have been supporting right in here. But if it opens lower tomorrow, what's it tell us? Wave one, wave two, wave three heading down. So. A lot of this analysis is just basically analyzing what the indicators or the combination of indicators. Look at our hanging man up here, followed by a gap down, off the 50, failed to the 50. Whoops, there's your, this is your proverbial blue ice failure. Look how it came down, fell through the ice, came up trying to find the hole that it fell through, couldn't find it ground, where do you think it's going? It's going to the bottom of the pond, which is down here at the 200-day moving average. Okay, that's about all I got. Are there any, oh man, I've kept you way over time. Are there any general questions on candlesticks? Uh, no.
remember, a, a signal is a signal if it's occurring in the over in the appropriate uh, area. Now, it is still bullish. But remember, you had a gap up in the overbought area. This would have been another one that if you close it out on the lower open, you could have always bought it back right there where you closed it out, knowing that it was now trading in an upward direction. Uh, yes, so this is what we're going to be analyzing. If you've been looking at charts, you understand the indicators, uh, you understand the signals, now the convergence analysis is what makes a more powerful combination of, of indicators. So if long, use stops maybe below the T-line so you don't get stopped out at the T-line. You can do that, yes. Okay, Jim, go ahead and do the double line. Everybody just use one pick. We'll try to get through this fairly quickly or the cows will be home. Snap, nothing. You just stay long as long as it stays above the T-line. eBay, nothing there. It wouldn't be long or short. There's no direction on this chart right now. Let's make this a little bit smaller. Yes, that's not not a good chart. IMGN. Bullish left uh left right combo. But you saw profit taking. If it opens positive, you can be buying because that tells you the profit taking's over, the buy signal is in place. XLY, closed above the T-line. You just stay long. SDC, J-hook pattern. I would still use the T-line as my stop, and I would be a buyer, especially if it came back up through today's high, telling you they were breaking out into new territory. GE, really a nothing chart. I wouldn't be long or short GE. Really not going anywhere, except, oops, let me change that now that I, you do have a bullish flutter kicker signal setup. So if they open this positive, you can be buying. I would think that's your first target, which isn't that far away, but at least you could be buying this one on positive trading tomorrow. Uh, the spiders for the uh, biotech still heading down, just like Labu, which is the uh, triple uh, uh, ETF, still heading down. Michaels, you stay short, but you saw some buying down in an area that there's been buying before in the oversold area. If I was short, I'd have a safety stop just above the high of that inverted hammer because that would tell me at least they're probably bouncing back up toward the T-line. But I wouldn't be a buyer of this one until you see some strength and a close above the T-line. SWKS, all you can do here is stay long. You've actually kind of broken it out into new territory. That's right, they're in the barn. Blue, uh, probably wouldn't be long or short. You're in a channel. It's not going anywhere. Southwest. Had a big day, but it doesn't have an exuberant chart. If you like it, you can be buying it. Now, I know... Today they were in the news because they're losing money because of the uh, Boeing planes that are grounded. But if you like this one, you can be buying it on positive trading tomorrow after your uh, bullish engulfing signal. Ryan.
Broadcom. Broadcom, I'm guessing, is up higher after hours. You want to stay long. I'm guessing uh, Broadcom as well as all the other ones are up uh, in that industry because of the Intel positive uh, report. NNVC, you can buy this one, but I, because of the magnitude of movement, you probably want to be trading it off your 10-minute chart because it's going to move around. You can see the, uh, the, the volatility, the percentage moves. Shake Shack. Ugh, let me clear this. All the horizontal lines. It's getting a little bit toppy. I would use today's low as a stop if I was long, because logic says if it comes back down through there after a hanging man, doji, 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 that they're coming back to test the T-line, which wouldn't make it a real strong chart at that point. Bitch, you stay long on kind of the uh, J-hook type pattern with the expectation that that's your ultimate target. The Russell. Ooh, it needs to open positive tomorrow to maintain the uptrend. If it opens lower, that means they're still selling off the small stocks. Walmart. Walmart's just a tough one to trade. It doesn't move around a whole heck of a lot. Um, eh, eh, yeah, I, yeah, ooh, Don, I can't come up with anything on that. That's just not a... A good place to have your money if you're if you're uh, trading. There's your gap up, best friend. Expect a 45 degree off of Kinder Morgan. That was a good chart. An M R A M, kind of a scoop pattern. You can see where the uh, resistance level is. So you can get ready to buy this. You've had an inverted hammer gap up. If you're buying, just watch carefully what it does right here at this level. You want to see it break out through that, that area. Zenga, stay short. Look at your bearish left-right combo that told you they were starting to take it down. I would suspect at least the 50-day moving average being the, the next Next target, and then see what it does at that level. Javaya, you stay long, but you can see you're getting a lot of whipsaw up here right now. So you probably want to be trading this more off your uh, the 10 minute chart, also. I would have a safety stop still at the T line. I wouldn't want to see it trade back in that direction. The Brazil fund. You can be buying this one. Wave three may be starting. It doesn't have a great chart because it's traded overseas quite a bit. That's why it's so kind of choppy. Target was still sagging. It did a bullish engulfing signal today. So if you were short in the oversold area, I would have covered the short, which means I probably wouldn't be long or short on this one right now. O.N., you can get ready to buy this one. It's not going to be aggressive, but it's probably still going to be a 45-degree. Prone, you can stay long, still keep your uh, safety stop at the uh, T-line. Same thing with Canopy. Roku did not have a good chart. There's nothing there. I wouldn't be long or short on this one. There's nothing to, to tell you which way. It wants to go. Uh, UNH, you can stay long on this one. Notice how this one bounced off the 34. You stay long as long as it doesn't close below the T-line. Oh, I had earnings today. Where is it trading now, Jill? Well, 
if it's still trading positive, you want to stay with this. So it's down 4%. All right. Which means it's down in this area. 125. All right. So that makes put in a little bit of a danger zone. That if they trade back below the low of uh, today, you don't have any strength in it anymore. Close it out. You can always buy it back if they turn it around and come up through that level. All right, everybody. Kept you way past bedtime. So we will see everybody bright and early tomorrow morning. We'll see you then.